Good morning, church. We are so excited to worship with you wherever you are. Pinecrest family. I'm Michelle Tuttle and I am here to give you some exciting updates and some encouragement. As many of you already know, people are facing difficulties and challenges today, but I want you to take heart and be encouraged because in James 1, 3 and 4, it says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete and need nothing. Today, we are kicking off our five-week series of Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Alongside this series, we are also kicking off Pinecrest Connect Groups, or C Groups. We are currently taking sign-ups. So, if you are not already signed up or not a part of a Sunday School online class, we encourage you to sign up before the groups get full. If you have any questions or you want to sign up, please contact our Connections Director, Paul at pbc316.com. On Wednesdays, our Next Gen Ministry is hosting Zoom Family Nights. For more information about this exciting event, please log on to www.pbc316.com. We also want to thank you for your generous giving, whether you're giving online, texting, or through the mail. We want to thank you for your faithfulness. 
we also want you to know that we cannot wait to see you hopefully very soon. But for now, let us prepare our hearts and our minds as we continue worship and find out what the Bible says about why bad things happen to good people. Thank you and have a blessed week. Church, there's one thing that hasn't changed and that's God's amazing love for us and his amazing grace. And wherever you're at, we know that we are in challenging times, but we can lift up the name of Jesus right where we're at. church. Father, we just pause this morning to worship you, to focus our heart's attention on you. Lord, because we've been surrounded by so much negativity this week. The news and our circumstances just seems hear any good news, Lord. Lord, there is good news because you are good. 
But this pandemic doesn't dictate how good you are, God. You are good. And you are good, good Father. Lord, I pray for anybody this morning that's struggling with that, struggling with wondering if you're good. God, they can just trust in your word this morning as we sing. You're a good, good Father, because God, you are good. In Jesus' name.
Well, good Sunday morning to you, Pinecrest family. Just uh, want to say a quick word of thank you to Pastor Tom Potter for preaching last week. It's really good for me every once in a while to have the opportunity to just sit and be preached to instead of doing the preaching. And when I'm feeling like I need a break, I can't think of a better guy in to have and preach for us than Pastor Tom. He did a great job with breakfast on the beach. So just want to say thank you very much for that, Pastor Tom. Today, I'm going to start a new series of messages. And so I want you to find Genesis in your Bible. Now, can you find Genesis? I hope so. Genesis is right after the table of contents. So it's easy to find. It's not like some of these books, you know, one or two pages and you're digging through it. But Genesis ought to be real easy to find. In fact, the passage I'm going to be preaching today are pages 2 and 3 in my Bible. So Genesis chapter 3, be finding that. Uh, But before I bring the message today, I want to make a little announcement. And here's the announcement. We are beginning virtual small groups at Pinecrest, you say, what in the world is a virtual small group? Well, our, our small groups are going to be discussion-based. And what are we going to be discussing in the small groups? We're going to be discussing the sermon. And what will happen with our small groups is I'm going to preach a series of messages that I'm going to begin today. It's going to last five weeks. And the series message is called, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? And the requirement for this is just simply that you watch the message and then you participate in a virtual small group, which we will do through the platform Zoom. So if you are interested in being involved in one of these virtual small groups, we've got them meeting just about every night of the week so we could hopefully fit your schedule if you wanted to uh, participate. Just let Paul Tuttle know, Paul is our director of small groups and he can be reached at paul at pbc316.com if you can't remember that that email address i think you can go to the website and find it there but i uh, just wanted to give you a heads up just in case you wanted to hop in on one of our small groups well as i already told you in the announcement today i'm beginning a new series of messages and the new series of messages that i'm beginning today is entitled Why do bad things happen to good people? And the title of today's message, that's the title of the series, but the title of today's message is this, Garden Snake, Garden Snake. Now in this series of messages, what is it that we are attempting to do? We are attempting to answer a question that has been a stumbling block for many, many people along the way. I know that was a huge stumbling block for me before I came to faith in Christ. It just didn't make any sense. How could bad things happen to seemingly innocent people? It is. It can be a stumbling block for people coming to faith. It can actually be a stumbling block to people's relationship with Jesus, even after they come to know him as Lord and Savior when terrible things happen happen and you find yourself asking the question, why? Why, God? Why would you allow this to happen? And I've certainly found myself asking that same question even as a pastor different times when I've stood up to preach funerals for people and I'm thinking to myself, oh Lord, why did this have to happen this way? And I can think of some real life examples that I've known along the way. A a nine-year-old girl raped, stabbed, left for dead in a patch of woods near her home. A 35-year-old mother of, of two young children is diagnosed with cancer. And then after a year of going through treatments, finally the cancer takes over and she dies. A father and a toddler of, 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 a, father of a toddler and an infant dies in an automobile accident at the hands of a drunk driver. And I'm thinking, Lord, how in the world could you leave these poor children without their daddy? Uh, These are all real-life situations that I'm talking about and can cause even people whose faith is very strong to begin to question and begin to wonder, why is it that God sometimes allows horrible things to happen to good and to innocent people? 
And, you know, I think about the current crisis we're in, COVID-19. Think about this. A lot of very vulnerable, very innocent people in nursing homes have become infected and passed away. And as we are reading and hearing in news reports, it's not just the elderly that are passing away from this disease. I mean, I've heard of numerous incidents of people much younger than I passing from this disease. Uh, and so we, we, we see a pandemic spread the globe and, and, and people are dying by the tens of thousands. And the, the estimates are just staggering as to how many people Experts are telling us may be dead by the time this whole thing is, is over. And you can a- ask the question often when you see these kinds of things, why, Lord? Why is it that, g- that terrible, bad things can happen to good people? Well, to answer this question, we have to go back. In fact, we have to go way back. In fact, we've got to go all the way back to the beginning. We've got to go back to where it all started. We've got to go to the garden. Genesis chapter 3 tells a story that in many ways serves as the foundation to the question, to the answer of the question that is at hand that we're considering in this series of messages and you know if you don't it's the foundation and if you don't get the foundation right then the whole house will tumble and wobble on you and I think that's a one of the main reasons why a lot of people struggle with the answer to this is because they've never put in the foundation they've never really understood at a foundational level how it all started how did we end up in the predicament that we are in this in this world and you do have to go all the way back to the garden in order to figure that out and gain the proper foundational understanding Now, in today's message, I'm going to consider all of Genesis 3, but for the sake of my reading, I'm going to just read verses 1 through 7, and then I'll make reference to chapter 3 and other places. I'm reading now in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, that is the snake, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said you must not eat it or touch it. By the way, God didn't say that part. Eve kind of added to it a little bit. Or you will die. No. No. This is the serpent speaking. You will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. And so she took some of its fruit and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband. Don't miss this part. Who was with her? He's standing there watching the whole thing unfold. And that's a key to interpreting this whole passage right. He was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would guide us as we attempt to consider this most difficult topic, and that is why do bad things happen to good people? I pray that you would help us today from Genesis chapter 3 to put the foundation in that we'll be able to build on in future messages and really come to a a whole lot better understanding of this world that we live in. And Lord, understand why. Sometimes, yes, it is true that bad things do happen to innocent people. And I pray that you would help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. What we have just read together is we have just read in Genesis 3 the account of the fall of man. This is where evil enters into God's perfect creation. Now, if we were to go back and read the creation narrative, 
what we would see is we would see some patterns. We would see that, you know, on day one, God made this. And day two, God made that. And then day three, and then day four, day five, six. But there's one common thing that we see after everything that God makes. And what is that that we see? We see after everything makes, God looks at what he made and he says something about what he's made. You know what he says? He says it's good. It's good. Now when he says it's good, he doesn't mean good sometimes in the sense in which we mean good. I mean, I think fajitas are good and I'm ready to, for the Mexican restaurants to open back up so I can go catch some fajita lunches. And, and I think fried chicken is, is good. Now, even as as good as I think fried chicken is, I don't think I've ever had a perfect piece of fried chicken. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Ernie Britz comes very close to perfect. I mean, that's about as perfect a piece of fried chicken as I've ever put in in my mouth. But even, even the best of what we describe good here on this earth has a completely different meaning. God has a totally different meaning in mind. When God looked at it and he saw that it was good, when God calls something good, let me tell you what he, he means by that. He means it's perfect. It's without blemish. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And when God said it was good, he meant That it was perfect. And we must remember something about this world that we live in. This world that we live in is not what God originally created it to be. It is not. It has changed. And in our remaining time together, we will examine how this biblical story of the failure of the first man and woman serves as a foundation to the broader question at hand, which is why do bad things happen to good people. And in doing so, we will notice, first of all, the instructions of God. The instructions of God. If you're a note taker, that'd be point one for you. The instructions of God. God gave instructions to Adam. We go back to Genesis 2 and verse 16. And the Lord commanded the man, you're to eat, you're free to eat from any tree of the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day you eat it, you will certainly die. So God had given these instructions to Eve. I mean to Adam rather. But it is notable that when God gave these instructions to Adam, Eve didn't even exist yet. Eve won't even be created and for another few verses. That doesn't happen until you drop down to verse 22 of Genesis 2. So God gave these instructions to Adam. And when he gave these instructions to Adam, uh, by the way, I want us to be reminded that God intended for these instructions to be followed. It wasn't an option. God wasn't just making a suggestion. God was saying, this is what you need to do. And to add emphatic, le- to add emphasis to it and to make it more emphatic, He says, listen, here's the deal. If you do what I tell you not to do, then you're going to surely die. And God meant what he said. But I'm reminded. I mean, that may sound uh, harsh to some of you that that God gives commands. But I'm reminded of this, that when God does give commands, God is doing it out of love. Because he knows. He knows everything about you. He created you. He knows everything everything about your body and how it it operates and he created it he knows every chemical reaction that is required to for your next heartbeat for your next breath and he created all of that and so if he knows that much about you don't you know that he knows how you're going to be the most fulfilled And so I'm reminded God's commands are not burdensome. He doesn't intend for it to be that way. He's just trying to help you avoid some pitfalls that would potentially destroy you. And so he gives these instructions to Adam and he says, don't eat from that tree. And he did this lovingly for Adam's benefit. 
And anytime God tells you to do something or not to do something, you need to remember that God's only telling you that because he loves you and he wants to benefit you, not because he wants to destroy you or ruin your fun or make your life boring. You know, that's what I used to think before I became a Christian. I used to think, man, if I become a Christian, then I, I'm just, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm just going to be bored all the time. I'm, I'm never going to get to have any fun, anything that's fun. I'm just, I'm not going to be, prohib- I'm going to be prohibited from doing that. And so I don't want to become a Christian. That's how I used to think before I came to know the Lord. And since coming to know Jesus Christ, let me give personal testimony and tell you, if you come to Jesus, you're not going to miss out on, on anything except things that you may not even realize are destructive to you. Because you know, this is the truth now. Sin can be fun for a season, and rebellion against God can be fun for a season. But I'm telling you, man, eventually the, the roosters come home to roost, uh, and it, it catches up with you. And there's terrible, terrible circumstances and terrible consequences that you don't see when you're kind of in the middle of it. I mean, you know, when you're, when you're in that bottle and you're having a good time with drinking buddies, you know, or you're smoking that dope, it may seem like fun at the time, and the enemy will make it look really, really, really fun, but what he doesn't show you is he doesn't show you that hook of addiction that gets into you, and then just ruins, ruins your life, and your life just falls apart from the inside out, and God's saying, hey, look, hey, listen, I, I love you, and I don't want you to do that kind of stuff, and I don't want you to, to hurt yourself, and so that's why he tells us to stay away from th- some things. Well, The first thing that we saw is we see the instructions of God. But secondly, I want us to see the cunning serpent. The cunning serpent. We know the identity of the serpent. It's the devil. And the Bible tells us about him. The Bible tells us in John chapter 10 that he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's also described in 1 Peter 5 as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I hate snakes. I can't stand them. I want nothing to do with them. I know, I know there's certain people that say, well, hey, listen, don't mess with that snake. They kill the poisonous ones. Well, listen, I don't trust myself. I ain't got enough sense to know which snake is poisonous and whether their head's shaped like this. I'd be that idiot that makes a mistake and, and I'd get bit by a poisonous snake thinking that I'm trying to save a snake that isn't poisonous. And so I can't, there's only one type of snake that I like. That's a dead one or one that's way over yonder and ain't, is nowhere near me. I can't stand snakes. They are sneaky. Hey, there's a reason for that saying, you know, snake in the grass. That's what snakes do. Snakes try to be sneaky. And they don't come right out most of the time. You know, a cobra will do this, but a lot of species of snakes won't do this they'll hide somewhere I remember one time I was I was hunting and I was walking along it was it was dove season I was hunting doves and I was by this pond and I and I walked up and and right on the other side of this log that I walked up to hiding on the other side of that log was this water moccasin and he put his head up and and reared up like he was gonna and I saw him just in time and i Boy, you're talking about doing the two-step and getting away from that thing. I got away from him in a hurry. And then I had to go to the house and change my britches. I mean, it was a, it was a tough scene, I want you to know. But I cannot stand snakes. The serpent in this story approaches Eve and gets her to question what God has said. And that's how he works. He says, you will not surely die. He's taking what God has said and he's twisting it for his own means. And he's using uh, reasoning to try to sidestep what, what God has said. And, and in a sense, this is what he's saying to Eve. He's saying to Eve, hey, listen, Eve, that's not what God meant He didn't really mean that. You won't surely die. And then he even twists it a little bit more and says, you know, it'll be good if you do this. It'll be good if you do this. Why? Because you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And hey, using reasoning, doesn't that sound sound good? 
I mean, hey, don't we want to be like God? That sounds like a good thing to me. So Eve, just come on and do this and you'll be more like God. Here he is taking everything that God has said and he's twisting it up and he's twisting it up for a reason. That is to get you messed up so he can get you exactly where he wants you. Because here's how the devil works. If he can get you to think a wrong thing, then he can get you to do a wrong thing and that's his goal is to get you to think wrong and get you to do wrong and so Eve gets twisted up and then there's Adam standing right beside her the world's biggest spineless wiener and instead of being a man and saying no Eve look don't listen to that snake he just stands right there passively and does nothing And so she eats and then he eats. The devil manages to get them to do the very thing that God has said not to do. And he used twisted reasoning to get them to do it. So we see, second of all, the cunning serpent. But then we see, thirdly, the horrible consequences. The horrible consequences. There are several consequences of the fall of man to see In this passage, first of all, Adam and Eve have sinned and they're now running from God and hiding from him. Genesis 3, 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. This is after they've done what he said not to. And they heard him walking through the garden. They heard the Lord walking through the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord called out to the man and says to to him says to Adam where are you now let me ask you a question do you think God didn't know where Adam was I mean come on he absolutely know where knew where Adam was he wasn't missing Adam he knows everything he knew where Adam was he was he was trying to he was trying to point something out here so the Lord God calls out says where are you and then in verse 10 he says I heard you in the garden. This is Adam responding to the Lord. And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And then he asked, the Lord asked him, says, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from that tree that I commanded you not to eat from? So now Adam and Eve are now running and they are hiding from God. And Adam is going to do what? I like to call the blame game, the blame game. That is, he's, bl- he's going to blame Eve and he's going to blame God for his disobedience. And this is, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. This is kind of what he says. You know, he says, Adam, did you eat from that tree? And then Adam will say, well, look, Lord, I, 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 you, everything was fine. He says, look, Lord, that woman that you made, I mean, everything was fine. Look, Lord, everything was great. And I went to bed single. And then I woke up married. And you shouldn't have done that. Look, because Lord, look, that woman that you gave me, she tempted me. She talked me into it. And I ate. So here, here we got. Here we got him. We got Adam now playing the blame game. And he's blaming who? He's blaming Eve. And he's also Blaming God, even, for something that is not God's fault. It's his own fault. So second, there's now a hostile relationship between mankind and the devil. Genesis 3.15, I will put hostility between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Listen, the devil has hated man ever since. He hates man the devil hates God he hates God he hates man and the devil will do anything at his disposal to try to draw men away from God why because he knows if he can do that if he can draw men away from God then he's drawing them away from the only one who can give them any hope so the devil and man are now in this hostile relationship with one another And then thirdly, as a result of the 
the horrible consequences that happened as a result of this story, the creation itself, and we need to understand this, the creation itself is fundamentally changed. It's no longer the same. It's not like it was any longer before the fall. Let's read Genesis 3, 17. The Bible says, The ground is cursed because of you. This is God. Speaking to man, the ground is cursed because of you, Adam. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it, for you are dust and will return to dust. Now, you look at everything that happens in that passage as a result of the fall. We see that painful labor is introduced. Adam used to tend the garden before the fall. You can read about that in the early part of Genesis, but there was no pain involved. Now, what happens when you do a hard day's work? When you do a hard day's work, you do some labor, you're liable to feel it down there in your back or your, your, your knees or some other part of your anatomy. Painful labor. That's now a part of the fall. He says, you're going to till the ground, and it's not going to be easy for you, Adam. You're going to till that ground, and you're going to try to plant stuff, and you're going to try to plant corn, and you're going to get thorns and thistles. And it never was like that before the fall of man. So this is what we understand, is that the creation itself, when sin entered into the world, was fundamentally changed and fundamentally marred. As a result of that, Romans 5.12 tells us about something else that we kind of pick up on in here. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people. So death wasn't a part of the original creation. Death came into the creation, according to the Bible, Because of man's rebellion against God, when man rebelled against God, that's when death came into the creation. And God looks at Adam and says, hey, listen, this wasn't part of the original plan. He says, but I'm telling you, as a result of this, this is what's going to happen. You're going to die. Creation has never been the same. It hasn't. That's how it all started, folks. That's how the world that we lived in got messed up. God made it good. He made it perfect. The devil tricked man and caused man to disobey. And through that disobedience, every bad thing that has ever happened can be traced back to that. That nine-year-old girl. That 35-year-old mama. That 25-year-old daddy, all that can be traced all the way back to the garden. And those and bad things happen in this world sometimes just because we happen to live in a fallen creation. Now, we've been talking about how the devil lies. And I want to... The Bible says that we need to be wise to the devil's schemes. And I want to let you in on the devil's greatest trick. He's been doing this since the beginning of time, and he's going to do it until until the moment he gets thrown into the pit of hell. And yes, that is ultimately where he's going to end up. He's going to end up there. Till that moment, he's going to be doing this. You know what he's going to be doing? He's going to be lying to people. This is the biggest trick in the world. He wants to get you to, he wants to lie to you to get you to do wrong. And then he wants to play the blame game. And in regards to this subject that we're talking about, bad things happening to good people, that's exactly what the devil wants to do to you. He wants to convince you that, hey, if God was good, God wouldn't let this happen. He wants to convince you that if God was all-powerful, then, then, then he would not let this happen. So he's not all-powerful. 
since he did let it happen. And he wants to twist that thing up in your mind. And what the devil wants to do is he wants you to get He wants to put you in a place where you blame God for every bad thing that's ever happened to you or anybody else. You know why he does that? He wants to keep you from God. That's it. He hates God. And he knows that God loves you. And so if the devil can get things twisted up and manage to convince you that every bad thing that ever happened is actually God is the one that's responsible. If, if Listen, if, if the devil can get you to that spot, then let me tell you what he can do to you. He can get you into a place where you end up alienated for the only being in this universe that can give you any hope at all. Don't let the devil do that to you. I wonder, I wonder if I might be speaking to somebody out there in cyberland. That you've blamed God for some things he didn't do. Now what I'm not going to be able to do in this series of messages, friends, I'm not going to be able to answer every question you have. There are some things, yeah, that don't even make sense to me. But this is what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to let the devil convince me that God isn't good. He is good. And let me tell you why I know he's good. I can tell you why I know he's good. It's called the gospel. The gospel. And gospel means good news. And I got some good news for you. This world is messed up, jacked up, and it's not what God originally intended for it to be. And yes, all kinds of horrible things happen to innocent people. But I want you to know something. God sent his only son to this earth to die on a cross for your sins. And if you will receive him as your personal Lord and Savior, then what are you guaranteed? You're guaranteed that you're going to go to a place where the curse gets reversed. This sin-cursed world that we live in, for those of us that know Jesus, will be a thing of the past. And we're going to, live in, going to live in a place forever where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more bad things that happen to innocent people. God is going to take this mess that we're in, in this fallen, messed up world, and he's going to reverse it back to what it used to be, what he intended it to be. That's called the gospel. Now, don't let the devil talk you out of responding to the gospel and believing the gospel because you can see the obvious. That Yeah, there are some bad things that happen in this messed up world. I want to encourage you who believe, who are believers, don't blame God. Don't let the devil do that to you. God is good. He's good all the time. And if there's anybody out there that's listening to me right now and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then listen, you are separated from the one who's going to make all things new. And that's not the way you want to spend your eternity. You want to spend your eternity in that place. And if you're not sure whether or not you have trusted Christ as your Savior, I want to give you the opportunity right now to do that to trust him as savior pray with me lord jesus i believe that you are the son of god and that you died on the cross for my sins i ask you to save me lord jesus i ask you to forgive all my sin come into my life lord change me make me the person you want me to be I surrender my heart and my life to you today, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, would you let me know? Send me an email. Reggie at pbc316.com I'd love to hear that you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And I can tell you what you need to do next in terms of your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Well, I want to just conclude by saying this, folks, and I'll leave it here. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. And don't you let the devil convince you of anything different. God bless you. I'll see you next time.